right. All right. Good morning. Good morning. It is, I think it's a Thursday. I'm here at work. Boy, this is the coldest week in Florida in a long time. So thank God for health, strength, no sickness, no disease, no colds. And I think this week I am sharing with you, and this is the, the third little excerpt of uh, my story. And yesterday I think I ended with the fact that uh, my dad, you know, some of the things that my dad, um, Victor, amazingly, uh, da, 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 I admired. Okay. Here I am. Here I am. Here I am. I'll get it together. Okay. And um, so I'm continuing from where I left off yesterday. And um, I just pray that a little bit of my story will give you a little background about me and a little background about uh, what qualifies me again, as I say, to talk to you about um, sexual addiction, to talk to you about recovery, not just scientifically, but also from the point of view of that I have the experience, I have the life experience, 40 years plus as a sexual addict, struggling, growing up in church, living in church. So going to church and being raised Christian have nothing to do with this, okay? Like I always tell people, this is a brain problem, and you got to understand it on a lot of different levels, not just a moral problem, not just disobedient to God, as many of us Christian men do. But this is something we need to talk about. So it begins a lot with, with our upbringing, and, and that's where I'm kind of, you know, some of the things that influenced me as a child. Okay, so here I go. I admired my dad, but I distanced myself from him. Yet the more I did that, the more people would tell me that I was like him. I disliked myself and tried to do anything opposite of my dad. My dad had a temper and was expressive. I was always in control and non-expressive. He was a womanizer. <laughs> I was not. Though I was deep into pornography and strip clubs and other things. At age 14 years old, I helped to establish my first band and with some of the other neighborhood boys. And at school, I had become a very good pianist and teachers discovered I could sing. So I began to be in drama clubs and I would practice with my friends after school. Soon we were known as one of the best young gospel groups in the Bahamas. That group was called Faith, Hope and Love. I don't know if some of you guys remember that. That's a long time ago. We used to open for the visionaries, by the way. And I started playing in concerts and writing songs. To this day, my father is dead and gone. And he lived and died and refused to come and to hear me sing or play, other than, I think, the last year or two of his life. And that was at church, okay? It wasn't until a few years ago, in his 90s, that's right, that he acknowledged that he was proud of my singing and recordings. And maybe I was good at it. Yet still he said, but son, nobody makes a living doing that kind of stuff. I think he's just from the old school. But it still hurt me because I craved that uh, acceptance from my father, that approval, as many of us men do. You need to be like me and own your own business or work hard to make it. If you have always gone, you ha son, you have always gone after that pie in the sky, dream careers. Hey, you have a good wife now and you need to give all that up. And amazingly, for the first time in my life, I did. I gave up, I gave in, and thus began my, the emptiness I could never describe. I still needed my father's affirmation, and I never ever received it. In fact, what I still hear, what I still hear his voice saying to me, son, you can't be my son. You take after your mummy, always dreaming, never living in the real world. Boy, you don't take after Victor Lockhart. Amazingly enough, my father had 27 kids, and I had... Let's see. And I had none. And he let me know. Okay? There ain't no way I could be a lockout and have no kids. Boy, what kind of lockout are you? To, to these days, that statement, to this day, that statement still rings in my head. At age 38, I was diagnosed with a brain aneurysm, and my life would change forever. The insanity of my life before recovery, well, let's break it down. In the scripture, it says, in James 1.8, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Before I began to deal with my addiction and get recovery under my belt, I was unstable. I would be up, I would be down. I would be around, I would be here, I would be there. After three marriages, first at age 21 for two years, the second at age 24 through uh, 42, 18 years, and the third and final at age 42, 
for 10 years, actually it's 16 years now plus, amazingly enough, through God's grace. Plus, so I've been married for 30 years plus just to three different women. I have been married more years than I have been single. You would think I would have a clue, but until I entered recovery, I was directionally challenged. I thought I was okay and everyone else had the problem. Life for me was a juggling act of my past versus my present, affecting my future, and I was going nowhere fast as usual. It was all their fault. They should understand. They should get along with everyone in my life, my dysfunctional family, my friends, and who had no, who had no boundaries, my music buddies to include, my fantasy world of dreams and aspirations. I was the puppeteer, the controller, who had orchestrated my insanity for years, and after all, you met me like this, so you should accept me like I am. Trust me like I am, with all my shortcomings that I really thought were strengths. Ooh, deception, deception, deception. I was a legend in my own mind and did not know my limitations. I was a 44 caliber weapon in the wrong hands. I could do lots of damage in a hurry. Looking back my first wife, at my first wife, I tried to rescue her. She was kicked out of the military for smoking marijuana, had no place to say, stay, so we got married on a whim. Actually, because she needed a place to stay. She could not go home to New Jersey. Her father was terminally ill, and she and her mother did not get along. She had a partial disability and was too depressed to work, so I took her in. Codependency raising its head. But to keep things looking good, to my mother and father, I told her, if you're going to stay with me, we have to get married. That's the religiosity of a Bahamian coming forward. Grace Pentecostal, okay? Now, there's a solid plan. My parents as Christians were the extreme kind, and they don't believe in shacking up. Now later, that would make you really crack up, because I find out that one of my family secrets were, my parents were not married as far as I could prove until 1987, which would mean for 30 years, no one knew they were maybe not married or were a common law. After three months, I would find out that my wife was an ex-prostitute, was locked up three times, was held hostage three times by her pimp, was involved in strip dancing in clubs, and still not totally over her old boyfriend. She was a high-class call girl for, let's just say, for professional basketball teams, which I will not call their names. This was too much for my 21-year-old mind. And when I found out on a visit to her dad that she had left and slept with her old boyfriend, made a pornographic video which I found was pregnant when she left without me knowing and had a miscarriage. That was too much for my 21-year-old religious mind to handle. So I started dating a lady who would become eventually my second wife. And I'll tell you about that tomorrow. So you see, drama, 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 always been in my life. But guess what? You might have drama too. And you need to write your story, I want to tell you. You need to write it down. You be, need to look at the timeline of your life because perhaps there are some clues as to why you struggle, why there's an addiction, okay? And I tell you, it goes back to those younger years. If you're, and if you're young, it goes back to those developmental stages in, your, in years. But guess what? The enemy wants to put a noose of addiction around your neck and choke you out. But if I got anything to do it, and I believe it's God's will you're listening to my voice, you are going to go free today because you're going to do what it takes. You see, it works if you work it. And if you trust God, miracles are normal, natural, and possible. So today I want you to have hope during this holiday season. As I tell my story, and as you hear the baby Jesus story, you're going to find that miracles happen. It might not start out great. It might be in the manger. It might be as an outcast. But in the end, God said he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And that which was lost was me. But now today, I am found. I love you. God bless you. Father, I pray for my warriors free, for freedom out there today. I ask you to bless them. I ask you to empower them. I ask you to strengthen them and help them to listen to this story and hope it encourages them to know that if I can do it, they can do it because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God bless you. Have a fantastic day. Bye-bye. Ciao. I'm out. Till tomorrow.